Part 2, Chapter 10. Here we're going to start with looking at how cancers are classified. And as you recall from the previous slides, cancer is going to arise from a particular cell that has gone rogue. All right, gone off the radar, AWOL, however you want to think about it. They are not functioning properly anymore. And malignant cancers are going to be named according to where in the body they originated from. So here are a few examples. You will need to know what these cancer types are and the originating cells. So carcinoma arises from an epithelial tissue. Sarcoma arises from connective tissue. Adenocarcinoma from ductal or glandular structures. Leukemia, blood forming cells and lymphomas, lymphatic tissue. And it's good to memorize these now because we will be talking about them later as we go on into the different systems. All right, now, cancer is also not a one-hit wonder event. I'm trying to think of different um, singers who have had one-hit wonders. And the only thing that comes to my mind is Billy, somebody or other, who had a um, number one hit when uh, prior to hitting puberty um, it was a country song and then his voice changed and he hadn't had no success after that and then he was on the voice this previous uh, round so cancer is not a one-hit wonder and what you see from this figure here is you have your normal cell and it's this nice yellowish orange color and the cell receives one mutation, it changed the color slightly, but as you can see going down the line, its progeny are still relatively normal compared to the original cell. But over time, you have a second mutation. Over time, you have a third mutation, a fourth mutation, um, additional mutations, and it's at that point where you have this malignant cell that develops. Um, this process is not quick. Each level on the figure there could represent a few years or several decades between each new mutation. So for a cell to become cancerous, there needs to be several. So for a cell to become cancerous, there needs to be several mutations that develop over time and are also maintained. Right? That maintenance is an important thing to remember because you could actually have correction. Right? Some of those mutations could actually be um, corrected by the natural machinery or programming within the cell. Uh, for cancer cells to be cancerous, one of their uh, characteristics is non or continued replication. All right, so what this figure shows are telomeres, right? These pink components at the end of the DNA, or at the end of each chromosome. After each cellular replication, the telomere will shorten just a bit, just like you see in this case here. After many replications, the telomere will be gone, and that will trigger the cell to stop dividing. This occurs in older cells, and if you recall from the previous slide, mutations occur over time. So if the older cell is acquiring or accumulating mutations within the DNA here, but at the same time the telomeres are getting shorter, right? Once the pink goes away here, the cell stops dividing and it undergoes death. And so those mutations go away because that cell goes away. However, some mutations in cancerous cells continue to add length to the telomeres and it's through an enzyme called the telomerase, and the cell continues to replicate. And so the DNA, or the, yeah, the mutations within the DNA that have accumulated within this cell cause the cell to become cancerous. It's not signaled to die because the telomeres are still very long, and then that cell can become cancerous. All right. Um, Angiogenesis. This is an important term, term to know. This is the development of new blood vessels for the survival of new tissue, and this tissue is going to be the cancer or the tumor. Under normal circumstances, this could be an organ, and 
is obviously important in embryogenesis when you're developing a brand new human or life form. This process is also important for neoplasms or your tumor. All right, the mass of cancerous cells still needs nutrients, just like a normal uh, tissue would. Without the support of blood vessels, the neoplasm would not be able to survive. And uh, some important features of this figure. And this is figure, uh, um, it's supposed to be fi or it's figure 1014. It's identical to figure 9 or 913 that you see here from the 5th edition. But you have these different growth factors, right? vascular endothelial growth factor, platelet-derived growth factor, um, uh, fibronectin growth factor. These are actually secreted by the tumor to act on the vascular system to cause growth. And now you have this direct blood supply to the tumor. And you have another one developing here. And now this tumor is going to receive oxygen and nutrients at a um, normal pace. And so it's going to continue to grow. And it's important to understand that it's the tumor that's actually secreting these different growth factors. So tumors are actually kind of smart, if you want to think about that, in terms of knowing what they need to do to get what they need to survive. All right, then metastasis. This is the spread of cancer. This figure is figure 919 from the 6th edition. And it's a little more simplistic than what you have in the 6th edition. Um, but that figure is next. So with any cancer, you can have invasion, which is just local spread. Um, invasion doesn't necessarily have to mean cancer. It can still be within a benign tumor. But that's just local spread. Um, cancer cells will invade surrounding tissues, so you can have invasion with cancer, even though you can have invasion with benign tumors. And that invasion still keeps the cancer localized. However, if the cancer cells gets to the lymphatic system, right, what they're showing in this process here, right here, right, you've got the process of angiogenesis. And now there is this blood supply where the cells can drain back into uh, the circulation here. If the cancer cells get to the lymphatic system and then into the blood, it can spread to anywhere in the body. And that is much harder to treat or makes the situation worse if it invades a particular organ or area. Um, and in this case, you have the cancer, you have the cancer cells getting into circulation. These are these funny guys here. They move uh, throughout the body. Um, they're going through the lungs. It gets caught in the uh, capillary bed within the lungs. You have extra vasation, which those cancer cells are going to leave the vasculature, and they then start, or they sit here in the lungs, and you develop uh, cancer in the lungs, even though that cancer didn't originate in the lungs. All right, this is a, a poor prognosis to have metastasis. However, uh, there's a couple of pages of material in your textbook that talks about the inefficiency of metastasis, and that's actually good news to a person who is dealing with cancer. Um, metastasis and or the process of metastasis is just moving to a new site. The cancer can move pretty easily if it gets through that process of invasion and finds its way into the um, vascular system, but the process of the cancer cell getting out of the vasculature into another tissue and then localizing there and taking hold, that process is inefficient. All right, which is good, because once it occurs, it's quite often um, a very poor prognosis and potentially deadly. All right, this is almost the last slide. Um, this is just figure 1019, which is a repeat or a more um, 
detailed version of what's going on in the previous slide. All right, you have the tumor here, and it is trying to leave. It gets different signals uh, from the cancer cells, from the tissue surrounding it, and it makes its way into the vascular system and gets out. All right, so you got to follow these little ghost-like cells. They're here originally. They get different signals. You've got tumor growth factor, this TGF, um, signaling this, the tumor to grow, and it can actually signal the cancer cells to break off, uh, to leave, to get into the vascular system, and out into another tissue. So looks a little complicated just because you have all the different cells involved but um, still very similar to the previous slide. All right, then the last slide, um, the effects of cancer. All right, the effects of cancer can be wide range depending on what type of cancer you have. Um, they can be major um, on the person, obviously, but it will depend on the type of cancer and the individual patient, what type of overall health that person is in, underlying medical conditions, that type of thing. Um, I like this slide because it is very interesting in, in how it shows the effects of cancer throughout the entire body. What this is showing is the effect of cachexia. And cachexia is an energy balance disorder where you have energy intake is decreased whether that is just simple food decrease or uh, lack of diet, lack of intake of food, um, but the energy expenditure is increased, and so you have wasting that will occur, a uh, decrease in muscle mass, and the person becomes very weak, loses um, fat reserves, loses muscle, and they become extremely um, uh, skinny, very weak. And side note, so you have some humor. Uh, my first year teaching uh, the patho class, um, I was sitting at the kitchen table one evening working on this uh, PowerPoint, and the picture of Cachexia was in the textbook. And, of course, um, I was sitting at a table with my daughter who was, I don't know, maybe just turned four at the time, and she was complaining about having to eat her dinner and didn't want to eat her dinner. And you've got a picture in your textbook of an older woman who is just skin and bones um, in the picture and sitting in bed. And I pulled the picture out and I said, Aubrey, this is what you're going to turn into if you don't eat your food. Uh, kind of mean, but, you know, just try to um, encourage your kids to eat what they should be eating. So back on target, um, cachexia is extreme wasting. and it's going to affect the muscle tissue, right? This shows the skeletal muscle, but you have to think about how much of our body is muscle or, or relies on muscular activity. So um, the heart is a muscle, right? So if the muscle is going to waste away, if it's going to lose its energy or the ability to work because of lack of energy, you've got heart issues. Um, the gut. All right, the propulsion of the food through your body or through your intestinal tract is going to be um, or is going to rely on the muscular activity. And if you have muscle wasting, then that activity goes down. And then you have issues within the gut because everything is sitting there. You have malabsorption. The liver doesn't work properly um, because your body is uh, thinking it's lacking energy it's going to start to break down fat cells. And so then you lose your fat reserves, both white adipose tissue and brown adipose tissue. And then overall it's going to start affecting the brain. And that is all for part two.